Hello, my name is Dr. Manika Balasegram. I'm a medical doctor, clinical research scientist, and public health specialist. And I'm here today to introduce uh, our webinar, Aiming in the Dark, What Happens When Diseases Spread Without Diagnosis? I'm joined here today by a panel of experts. Dr. Katharina Bohem, Chief Executive Officer of FIND, Erin Duffy, Chief of Research and Development, CARBEX, Robin Patel, Chair of the Division of Clinical Microbiology in the Mayo Clinic, and Amadou Al-Fasal, Scientific Director of the Institute Pasteur in Dakar, Senegal. First, I'd like to thank you, the organizers of this webinar, the Antimicrobial Resistance Fighters Coalition, the University of Minnesota Center of Infectious Disease Research and Policy, the American Society of Microbiology, the Wellcome Trust, Surveillance and Epidemiology of Drug-Resistant Infections Consortium, and the US CDC. Before we start, I'd like to introduce the overall webinar series, which is AMR in the light of COVID-19. We've all experienced firsthand the reality of untreatable infectious diseases, particularly now COVID-19. But COVID-19 is not the only threat we are facing. Many bacterial and fungal infections that were previously considered untreatable that treatable, are no longer responding to the drugs designed to treat them. COVID-19 therefore foreshadows a grim future that if we don't mobilize a global response to the growing threat of antimicrobial resistance, we face infectious diseases without adequate treatments. This webinar is part of a four-part series where global experts will discuss how COVID-19 pandemic could reshape strategies for combating the threat of antimicrobial resistance around the world. And in this current webinar, we're going to be focusing on diagnostics. Now, the pandemic has demonstrated the critical role of diagnostic testing to steer our public health response. We also know that diagnostic testing for bacterial and fungal infections result in improved use of antibiotics and therefore better antibiotic stewardship. But whereas testing for COVID-19 has benefited from innovation and rapid uptake, testing for drug-resistant infections remained sadly underutilized. The question is, how can we improve the effective use of diagnostics for bacterial and other infections? What have we learned from COVID-19? Are there parallels with antimicrobial resistance? Are there future risks posed for our fight against antimicrobial resistance? And what do we need to change in the development and use of diagnostics to combat antimicrobial resistance? Now, to answer these questions, we have a panel of specialists, and I'm going to introduce the first one, Erin Duffy. Erin is the Chief of Research and Development at CARBEX. CARBEX, as you all know, is a global nonprofit partnership dedicated to accelerating antimicro antimicrobial research to tackle drug-resistant bacteria. With up to 480 million to invest in 2016 to 2022, CARBEX funds the world's largest early development pipeline of new antibiotics, vaccines, diagnostics, and other tools for bacterial infections. Prior to CARBEX, Erin worked at Melinta Therapeutics, where she was the executive vice president and chief scientific officer. So, Erin, thank you very much for joining us. And I'd like to start with an opening question. COVID-19 has shown a light on the importance of global access to diagnostics. Through your experience at CARBEX, what are the biggest challenges that diagnostic developers faced in developing and bringing to market devices that can actually help tackle antimicrobial resistance? And what have we learned from COVID-19 in this? Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation. I must say, just taking a step back, my background has been in antibiotic drug discovery, and so I'm learning on the ground uh, about diagnostics for AMR, and I'm very honored to be on this panel. Uh, to answer your question, um, and I think this is true in diagnostics in the general sense, but in the CARBEX portfolio, there are many approaches, uh, many novel approaches that carry a high degree of technical risk. Um, and so, you know, in a space where market opportunities are unclear, R&D uh, reimbursement and funding is limited, both in high-income countries and also in low-middle-income countries, it can be difficult for diagnostic developers to raise initial funding for AMR product when they could be making products for other areas, oncology as an example. And so we're hopeful that, you know, our funding and, and scientific uh, support 
and encourage or inspire these developers to target AMR first before focusing their products in other directions. Of course, that's not going to be enough. Uh, and we are very hopeful that we'll see downstream investment that can support global access and market uptake of these technologies. In terms of what we've learned from COVID-19, uh, I think there are a number of things. Uh, I think prime, you know, number one uh, is that dedicated funding and a strong market need can really drive rapid innovation. Um, you know, certainly we've seen, um, you know, SARS-CoV-2 tests that were developed in a matter of weeks. Uh, and so, you know, it's really encouraging and I think it could be done in AMR as well. Another thing we've seen is that there's now a very large install base of diagnostic instruments, both in high throughput and low throughput labs, you know, like at your Walgreens or your local CVS in the United States. Uh, and these serve as a testing infrastructure for a very large population. How can we leverage this for AMR rather than building new every time? Another thing, and this is pretty amazing actually, is that all these SARS-CoV-2 test results are fed into a real, are fed real time into a master database. Now that's amazing. And you know, how can we do this uh, on a national and global level for AMR? And then finally, and, and not appropriate for all uh, bacterial infections, but at-home testing and consumer-based testing are really on the rise. Uh, and so you can think about areas, for instance, like you know, urinary tract infections, um, and you know, could these be used at home as well? And so it have a real positive impact, of course, also on antibiotic stewardship. Mm. Great, thank you very much, Erin. And I think Carbex is quite well known for its um, our focus on drug development, I think, particularly in the field where I'm working and I'm coming from an organization focusing on drug development. Um, but why have you seen, and maybe explain a little bit more, why do you see co-development of diagnostics as critical to supporting appropriate use of newly developed antibiotics or antibiotics that are even currently in the late stage pipeline? And how do you bring these two aspects together in your portfolio in Carbex? Uh, that's a great question. I, I think there are two aspects that are really important here. And the first is you know, on the actual conduct of clinical trials. So how do you find uh, the, you know, the appropriate patients um, you know, and how do you guarantee that you're using the right antibiotic um, you know, for their infections? And so you know, certainly the conduct of clinical trials is one thing. And then the other thing is market uptake on, on the far end. Um, and so without this, you know, if you're not on these automated susceptibility testing uh, platforms, then you're not going to be used. Um, and so, you know, when you need that new antibiotic, it's going to be very challenging. And, you know, this is why we've invested in this. We'd like to see, you know, in the advanced development stages, uh, an emphasis not only on uh, the build of new uh, antibiotics, but also on diagnostics as well. Uh, there's another part of this, of course, that is, you know, how, how can diagnostics improve the usefulness of current antibiotics, so antibiotics that are on the market? Um, you know, and, 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 you know, you think a really great example, again, in urinary tract infections or, you know, Neisseria gonorrhea, which, of course, um, you know, your organization, you know, certainly is, is focused on as well. Um, and, and this is that, you know, we've had several classes of antibiotics that have been used and used very effectively over many years that are now, um, you know, either unable to be used completely um, or, you know, there's concern about them and, and that's all about resistance. And so, you know, particularly when you're focused on last line therapy, like in gonorrhea, really there's ceftriaxone. Um, you know, if we had a good diagnostic to say, in these, in these patients, you know, using a fluoroquinolone would actually be okay, you know, then that would certainly help us, uh, you know, again, with antibiotic stewardship to reserve the new drugs for when they're needed, uh, but also get the right therapy to the patients in real time. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, you mentioned that in COVID-19, it's amazing what dedicated funding and a strong market need can do. Um, you're partly there providing some dedicated funding, but how do you see us addressing the issue about the strong market need in antimicrobial resistance? Particularly yeah, I mean, that, that's certainly, yeah, no, I mean, that, that certainly, you know, is, um, you know, is a really big issue. I guess we're hoping, 
uh, again, you know, to be able to leverage uh, the investments here in, in COVID-19. And I don't just mean resources, financial resources, but I mean the time and the energy. You know, right now, it's, it's kind of an amazing time for us. The whole world is paying attention to the importance of testing and preventing infections. Sure. Um, you know, everybody knows there isn't a treatment uh, for COVID. Um, and, and that, you know, has really shown a light here um, on the importance of diagnostics. Um, and this, you know, frankly, could be the future of bacterial infections. It's not here today, uh, but it certainly could be. And we've just gotten so used to not thinking about how antibiotics are useful in everyday life. And so again, to be able to leverage some of these investments and take the opportunity while, while the world is listening to say that we do need to invest in these. We do yeah. need to not only produce good antibiotic solutions, but also the ability to diagnose and treat effectively. Great. Um, Erin, I've got a further question for you, which is that we have a lot of people here in the webinar today that are really focused on a whole range of issues in diagnostics, from research to policy and use, and working at a, at, at a national academic level to a more global mm -hmm. public health level. What do you think there are things that they could prioritize to help drive improved utilization of diagnostics? Particularly, I think, in the context of spotting outbreaks and developing policies to address them and, and actually beating back antimicrobial resistance. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think probably everybody on the phone has a role to play here. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, I, I think is very important, and, and you mentioned it, but, you know, what we've seen here with COVID is, you know, diagnostics reporting systems you know, that are built for rapid results uh, and reporting of rapid results. And, you know, that's an active process, a little different from surveillance, which is, of course, passive, um, but really necessary. And, and how could we leverage that? Um, you know, again, it all comes back to asking, you know, how did this whole community of diagnostics developers and, and of course, you know, prevention and, and therapeutics as well focused on uh, COVID, you know, how did they do it? How did they you know, from basically zero to 60 miles an hour, how did they do it so quickly? Yeah. So let's leverage that time and energy. Um, everybody here has a role to play. Yes, I'd agree with you. And I think that um, it's probably something we can discuss as a group towards the end of the webinar. But mm -hmm. you mentioned the issue of the fact that, you know, we're, we're living through an extraordinary moment and perhaps there's an mm -hmm. opportunity now um, for us to, I think, to translate this into... Uh, also how we can get more focus and uh, I would say attention to antimicrobial resistance. Do you have any final right. comments or, or, or thoughts to add um, before we move on? No, I'll just say, I, you know, that, that we at Carbex have been thinking a lot about, um, you know, our portfolio and, and the role of diagnostics in that. And what we've come to recognize is where, you know, where our strengths really exist um, is to say, yes, we have a, a broad, very innovative, a portfolio of investments in treatment and prevention. Um, but again, how do we make them most successful? Well, that's going to be with understanding when to use them and how to use them. And so we're sort of focusing our diagnostics platform on asking the question, how can we build um, you know, the best um, products uh, and then give them you know, the things that they need in terms of you know, speed, price, um, you know, et cetera. And so that's how we're focusing our diagnostics. Great. Thank you very much. And stay online. We'll be back to you uh, a little bit later on. So Absolutely. I'd like to move Thank to you. our. Thank you. I'd like to move to our next presenter um, and uh, next speaker, uh, who Dr. Robin Patel, uh, Professor Patel. Um, she is an Elizabeth P. and Robert E. Allen Professor of Individualized May, uh, Medicine in the Mayo <laughs> Clinic. Uh, now, Professor Patel is a professor of medicine and microbiology. She's the director of infectious disease laboratory and co-director of the clinical bacteriology laboratory at the Mayo Clinic. She and her colleagues develop and deploy cutting-edge assays for clinical detection of bacteria, identification of bacteria, and characterization of antimicrobial resistance and susceptibility. She is the immediate past president of the American Society of Microbiology and fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology. She has published over 400 peer-reviewed manuscripts and she holds numerous advisory positions, including the NIH and NIAID. So Robin, welcome. Uh, I have an opening question for you. 
Uh, COVID-19 has highlighted the importance of local and regional access to diagnostics in the management of disease outbreaks. Uh, what have we learned from the deployment of COVID-19 diagnostics that is relevant to antimicrobial resistance? Are there things that we've learned in COVID-19 that we should keep, enhance, expand, uh, and even help us to uh, better improve to the detection and management of the spread of drug-resistant infections? Well, thank you so much, uh, Monica, for the question. And um, good day or good evening, everyone uh, listening to uh, this webinar. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of eyes were focused on the AMR situation. In my mind, both are crises. Uh, we sometimes uh, sort of forgot about the AMR crisis because it's been going on for so long. And honestly, sometimes I think people get bored and tired of it and lose focus. Maybe we're seeing the same thing with COVID-19 to some extent. But the data, of course, tells us that the AMR situation is getting worse over time. And in fact, COVID-19 may be in process of exacerbating it. On the flip side, however, as you point out, we have learned a lot from COVID-19 about diagnostics. We've been able to rapidly develop and deploy diagnostics, including, I think very importantly, at the point of care. Point of care microbiology diagnostics were slowly emerging prior to the pandemic, but are recognized today as being what we need in many situations. And I think COVID-19 has really uh, helped illustrate this. We appreciate, not surprisingly, that long test turnaround times are not acceptable. We've innovated in terms of specimen types, things that we didn't previously think would be possible. And most importantly, we've shown that we can come up with and deploy novel diagnostics quickly, very quickly. It's my hope that what we've learned to do with COVID-19 can be carried into our other crisis, AMR. The challenge though, as I see it, is that AMR is not a single agent like COVID-19. It's not just a respiratory virus like COVID-19, and it's unlikely to be controlled with a vaccine, not to say that a vaccine-based strategy couldn't be part of a more comprehensive approach. So in my mind, it's back to diagnostics. We definitely need better diagnostics to address AMR. Much of what we're using in our clinical practices throughout the world is decades old. Better diagnostics will make sure that patients who have drug-resistant infections rapidly get treatment that covers their infection. But it will also allow patients who don't have drug-resistant infections to get our tried and true conventional treatments, or if they don't have an infection, no treatment. Uh, and therefore, they won't have to receive a treatment that we don't have very much experience with, something we've learned with COVID-19, which is costly and which may itself be contributing to the AMR crisis. This then will help preserve our newer antibiotics for those who need them. We do, however, need to define and recognize the value of diagnostics, something I also hope has been brought to bear with COVID-19. And the reason that I mention this is that I perceive that clinical microbiology diagnostics, including those for AMR, are considered cheap tests, that there's a reluctance to consider paying for new microbiology tests, some of which may be better, if they're more expensive than older tests. But we may, in some cases, need to pay more for better technology. So I think we not only need new tests, but we need to demonstrate their value. And one way to demonstrate value of diagnostic tests is through implementation science studies. We've carried out two implementation science studies uh, at our institution and in collaboration with the Antibacterial Resistance Leadership Group of the National Institutes of Health. And what you do in an implementation science study is you show whether a diagnostic is worth using or not. Value can be measured in a number of different ways. In the case of AMR, I think it could be measured in terms of 
simply utilization of antibiotics using less and using what you have more appropriately is, I think, a, a great outcome, although we could probably debate that uh, because some like to see harder outcomes like mortality and length of stay in the hospital and so forth. But the two studies that we carried out to date, and I will say we're working on a third right now that's in progress, uh, the two that we carried out had to do with blood culture-based diagnostics. We have a lot of rapid diagnostics that can be done on positive blood cultures, uh, which is great. The technology, I think, has really advanced in that arena. But for the most part, those tests are add-on tests. In other words, you don't get rid of anything. You just add another test. And there are costs and logistics associated with that. Honestly, these types of diagnostics are quite costly. And I, I mentioned that cost is a big concern. And, and so we really wanted to know, will these tests add value for the patients who are tested with them? And uh, is there a particular way to really uh, maximize that value? So the first study we did was with a multiplex PCR panel that looks at a number of different bacterial species or groups or uh, genera, as well as a few resistance genes. And it's performed as soon as a blood culture bottle is positive, it can be performed. And we randomized patients to have this test or not have this test. And we actually had a third arm where they had the test, but they also had real-time antimicrobial stewardship from an antimicrobial stewardship team. And what we learned from that study is that, yes, these diagnostics can improve the utilization of antibiotics in with certain organisms in particular, but really that value, especially in terms of de-escalation, was maximized when the diagnostic was paired with uh, antimicrobial stewardship. So uh, not just the diagnostic alone, interestingly. And the value was, was most on the gram positive side in that study. The platform we looked at didn't have a lot of resistance genes on the gram negative side. And so we learned that just knowing the name of the organism that's gram negative in the patient's blood when you already knew it was a gram negative bacillus didn't really provide all the information that people needed to escalate or de-escalate their regimen comfortably, I would say. Um, and so we did a second study with gram-negative bacteremia, positive blood culture bottles, where we looked at a rapid phenotypic susceptibility test. And again, we used the same study design, except having learned that antimicrobial stewardship works, we just put it in both arms and we randomized patients to have this diagnostic that is rapid phenotypic susceptibility testing of gram-negative bacilli directly from positive blood culture bottles or not. Uh, and what we learned again is that could help us in the utilization of antibiotics. So we have implemented uh, both of those technologies into our clinical practice. And I can talk more about details of, of how uh, later on, but I think we really need to understand uh, when tests are valuable and show that value. And hopefully that will help make the case for using some technologies that may be more expensive than what came before in our clinical practice, because yeah, yeah. I don't think anyone can argue that AMR is costly uh, and, and we need to make some investments in order to deal with it. Thank you very much, Robin. I think that was quite an quite a interesting um, answer. And it's very interesting that you talk about the two implementation studies that you do. I fully agree that this is something that's extremely valuable from my own experience in Korea and other areas, including, for instance, in malaria, this has been shown to be extremely important. Um, and to me, I think it's really about just improving and having better clinical care and better medicine, practicing better medicine. But of course, we have to show the benefits, uh, I think, to policymakers and people who make the decisions around funding. So I'd like to go to that point, actually, because you did you hit, you, you hit the nail on the head with a really important point. One of the big differences between COVID-19 and antimicrobial resistance, which I have to explain, you know, quite frequently, is that we're talking about a broad set of, of microorganisms, very different and complex resistance mechanisms, um, and the I would say the epidemiology of that, genetics of that, is is quite complex. So you've mentioned things that you can do practically at, at and studies that you can do, and this can be helpful for policymakers and funders and and people who make decisions on that at that level. But what do you think clinical labs can do to prepare? 
for better, uh, I would say, better utilization of, of tools that can improve, you know, diagnostic services and how we use antibiotics. Yeah, this is a great and complex question. I mean, as much as there are questions about diagnostics for COVID-19, as you mentioned, unlike COVID-19, AMR is not a single agent. There are so many different diseases that involve, say, pneumonia, bacteremia, skin and soft tissue infection, and so forth. So many different bacterial species and so many different antibiotics and resistance mechanisms that are all encompassed with that one piece, a diagnostic for AMR. So I, the combinations should be well over several hundred of possibilities that one would need to consider in a clinical mm -hmm. microbiology laboratory. It can really be daunting to know which tool or tools to adopt, and especially um, in the face of, you know, are really not understanding the full value of some of the tools that are emerging, again, an issue that might be addressed by implementation science studies. So my approach is to think of diagnostics, just as you said, as tools, but I think of them as tools in a toolbox. And we need several tools to carry out our medical practice, not just one. I don't think there's going to be a single tool that's going to solve this crisis. And then we also need to know how to use the tools that we have. And different jobs need different tools. So um, accordingly, the needed tools will vary from laboratory to laboratory. And that will depend on the clinical practice that's served, the way antibiotics are used in that clinical practice, local resistance rates, which vary uh, from not just country to country, not just city yeah. to city, but actually a hospital to hospital, and the types of infections seen, I think the presence or absence and how antimicrobial stewardship is delivered also needs to be kept in mind. And then locally, laboratory hours, because in many places, laboratories are not open 24-7, and that really can change the equation in terms of which diagnostics might be most helpful. And of course, the level of technical expertise available in the laboratory. It's been interesting to me that some of the most novel and cutting edge commercial assays may actually be of greatest benefit to smaller laboratories and not the traditional clinical microbiology laboratory in a large academic hospital. In any case, it's not a one-size-fits-all proposition. Adoption and implementation of diagnostics for AMR requires close coordination with patient-facing clinicians who are going to be the ones who might order those tests and most importantly will receive and act on or not act on results of such tests. They need to understand what the test results mean and how ideally to act on this. And as you introduce new technology, that's not always self-evident. I've always said that if a test doesn't make a difference, then it's not worth doing. The test really needs to make the difference it's intended to make as well. And AMR is complex. So results and actions need to be taken um, very carefully, and it needs to be clear to everyone involved what actions need to be taken. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, and I think that was that was a pretty pretty good answer to I think a, as you say a fairly complex question. So um, we'll be moving on to our next um, uh, speaker. Stay on line, Robin, and we will be coming back to you for some uh, additional questions at the end. And I will just add um, to all of you who are on this webinar. Uh, I do believe that there is a, um, a questions or chat box where you can. Uh, pose questions um, to the speakers here today. So our next speaker is Amadou Alpha Sal. Dr. Sal is the head of the Arbovirus and Viral Hemorrhagic Fever Unit and director of the WHO Collaborating, WHO Collaborating Center and scientific director of the Institute Pasteur of Dakar, Senegal. His research focuses primarily on diagnostics, ecology, and evolution of arboviruses and viral hemorrhagic fevers. Dr. Saal has published more than 100 papers and book chapters and has given uh, numerous scientific presentations and communications at international meetings. So we go over across the world to Dr. Saal. Uh, welcome to this webinar and thank you for being here with us today. Um, 
I have an opening question for you. The COVID-19 outbreak has highlighted the importance of diagnostic testing in the management of disease outbreaks. How critical are diagnostics in the management of infectious disease and disease outbreaks in developing countries, low and middle income countries? Yes, thank you very much, Manika, for having me and also for inviting me to, to, to this important panel. Uh, I think your question is extremely important in the sense that COVID-19 has highlighted the importance of diagnostic, particularly in LMICs. And what I think in terms of criticity of uh, diagnostics is that if you look at the LMICs, diagnostics is usually the point of entry to the health system. People would go to the health system because they look for services, uh, mostly to know what happened in terms of disease, what do they have. And by being the point of entry, you look at diagnostics in most of LMIC, they are really where you have the weakest links of the health system. So it means that by weakening diagnostics, you're weakening the whole health system. And I think when, I, when we have... So such a weak diagnostic system in most of LMICs is mostly due to the fact that either people have not been managed well because the diagnosis was wrong at the beginning, or people have to make choice in the way that they have been using the different service uh, that may, at the end of the day, make the system not efficient. And this is one of the very first important question that people need to understand. It's about the health system. It's not really about finding some etiology for some disease. By doing that properly, then you support the whole health system. The second reason why it's very important also to think about it is in most of the developing countries, the main difficulty is to strategize well how to avoid the health system. And meaning that if you do not have proper health metrics to good surveillance, mostly based on diagnostic, then in order to establish a good policies and to, in order to see the real impact of what you're doing and monitoring properly over time, it's very difficult to have good tools. And if I just want to focus a little bit on AMR, uh, the, the critical role that uh, diagnostic is playing in AMR is if you look at really in developing countries, the main issue with AMR is people are using a lot of antibiotic uh, in a non-proper way. Most of the patient would come without a diagnostics. And then since people are not doing properly diagnostic, they are doing some syndromic management, clinical management, meaning that in order to treat a malaria, we want, if we do not have a malaria test, people would treat malaria and cover with some antibiotics. At the end of the day, you're using a lot of antibiotics, not necessarily use, because people do not have at the very beginning to distinguish whether they should use it or not, which impacts in terms of uh, resistance increase, which impact in terms of cost, because you're using antibiotics that are not really efficient, and which also impact in the trust in the health system, because people are not, not getting good health from the treatment they are receiving. And we know that through COVID that the trust is the best, actually, um, tools we may have in order to support and work with that. And I just want to end up very quickly with one critical impact of diagnosis. When people are sick and they're not very well treated, we are facing something like health, uh, the human capital, as people can use, develop the countries. And I'm pretty sure we're losing a, a, a very important part of the, the country economy because people are not healthy, because they are not handled well by, by the health system, which is really failing for diagnostic as an entry point. So these are the, the, the key point I wanted to highlight when it comes to the criticity of diagnostic when it comes to LMIs. Thank you. That was a, a, an exceptionally good answer. I have to say I've been... In my career, I've done quite a lot of work uh, around advocating for better diagnostics, and I just wished I'd just used all the points you'd made in, in a few minutes um, uh, there, because I think it was excellent, really, about diagnostics being, you know, an entry to the health systems, weak, weak diagnostic capacity, meaning weaker health systems, and this being really about trust in, in the health systems. And I think that's come out so clearly with COVID-19, just in the general population, people understanding the value of diagnostics now more than just as a test that provides a, an, an answer to a problem, but much more kind of a, at a health system level and seeing the strength of their health systems demonstrated uh, through that capacity. So I'll, I'll, I'd like to go to another question, actually, which is really then about why do we have a problem? What are the key barriers um, 
this all sounds very compelling, what you've said, but how can we get there and overcome these barriers towards, uh, you know, up to uptake of appropriate diagnostics in low-middle-income countries um, that are, that are going to be so fundamental to improving healthcare and tackling, uh, I think, you know, major public health issues like antimicrobial resistance? Yes, thank you for, for that question. I think this is a very important one because if we really think what are the key issues, I would probably bring three main, the, the most important to me. The first one is the, the channel to give that diagnostic service, which is really laboratory system. And when I talk about laboratory system, I'm not talking about just uh, one size fit all labs, but uh, the primary contact that people have in LMIs is really the primary health care level. So when we think about diagnostics, we, we should think of what do we do at the primary health care level up to the very sophisticated central lab. So having good lab that is very customized to the need is the number one problem. And it's not just about capacity to test and having competent people, but making sure that the performance are maintained over time, which implies quality management system, making sure that things are done properly in a way. And when we talk about laboratory also, we have to, to make sure in terms of access, we're dealing with geographic equity. Meaning that um, most of the people may live in uh, countryside, like at uh, the primary health care level, making sure that point of care testing that we're, we're talking about, rapid diagnostic tests, can make a huge difference. So number one is the channel to, to get those diagnostics. The number two problem is the cost. Cost is one of the main driver of the system uh, in in, uh, in LMIs when it comes to diagnostics. Uh, I've been really facing and witnessing a situation where people, because of the cost, have actually to prioritize whether they would take a diagnostic or get straight to the treatment. Because if it is too expensive, rather than paying the diagnostic and not having money to get the treatment, people may choose to take chance for diagnostic and go for a treatment, which may um, not the right things to do because it may be a problem. Anything that goes beyond three dollars as a diagnostic that may be a serious problem. And in this regards, when we talk about uh, uh, having, it's very important to look at, at diagnostic in terms of business model, market sharing, and also think about how through local manufacturing we can improve things and make sure that you can customize uh, and, and focus and address this barrier in terms of cost. And the last part is something that uh, the industry is really talking about a lot, which is mostly the regulatory system. Most of the tests that are used in LMICs, particularly in Africa, are not necessarily early designed for that market. So usually the industry have a serious problem to register from one country to another. It's a serious problem so because you may have a, pro a solution, but having to go through like evaluation and having a proper regulatory system to get access and get it licensed is extremely important. Um, I may add one last comment is that the way we are addressing diagnostics is uh, we need really to reach the community sometimes. Because, uh, because of the geography, you need to have a different way and do some community either surveillance or diagnostic using community healthcare worker or people that are close to the population. And right now, we're addressing those questions in collaboration with FINE and other partners about how by bringing diagnostic at the community level, we can improve. So it's a lot also about the delivery system. So that's, these are the key barrier I see and sort of solution I, I, I can uh, probability. One final question very quickly. Um, what have you learned in your setting about COVID-19 diagnostics and the introduction of COVID-19 diagnostics and how do you think this could be relevant for AMR if at all? Um, I think Decentralization has been absolutely critical. The main thing about diagnostic and COVID has been to say, okay, if you detect early, you improve the chance of transmission being controlled quickly, and you are in a position to improve outcome in terms of treatment. So the best way to do is to decentralize testing. And AMR, if it is decentralized at the national level in most of those countries, you improve a lot. Second, the importance of surveillance. In many countries, you do not have an idea about very good surveillance system uh, that is able to inform the health metrics and AMR on about uh, what are the, the most important resistance. So this is important, which is also important, is the, the role of innovation. 
it's about finding solutions that are really customized. So meaning that we need to get to do good research uh, in, in order actually to solve the problem. Experience I want to relate is the importance of local manufacturing because obviously um, for COVID-19, the main problem was really to get access to the tools to do the testing. So in this regards, we completely realized through um, an initiative that we are doing with FINE and Fondation Mirieu and, and IRB called Jatropics by being capable of uh, developing and manufacturing locally some rapid diagnostic for COVID-19, then you can improve testing and you can improve um, the, the control of the disease. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amadou. Um, so please stay online and uh, we'll be coming back for a general Q&A towards the end. Um, I'd like to move to our next speaker, um, which is Dr. Katharina Bohem from FIND, whom uh, obviously it's an organization that's already been mentioned a couple of times by, by Amadou. Um, uh, Dr. Katharina Bohem is the CEO of FIND, uh, the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics, which is an international nonprofit organization dedicated to transforming diagnostics and testing to solve some of the world's most challenging health issues. FIND is co-convener of the Access to COVID-19 Tools, also known as ACT, Accelerator Diagnostic Partnership. She's a member of numerous WHO expert groups and a diagnostic technical advisor for um, the EDCTP, the European uh, and Developing Countries Clinical Trial Partnership. There's probably a lot more to that, but Katrina, let's... Uh, uh, start and I'll open up with a with a question. Um, what are the collaborations and initiatives that have been deployed to show global development and access for COVID-19 tests? And of those, what should we look to keep, enhance, expand, improve uh, to to really help us look at access to diagnostic tools for uh, antimicrobial resistance? In other words, is there things that we could repurpose uh, for use in AMR? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Monica, and thank you for the invitation to be part of this interesting discussion. You know, as Amadou has said, COVID-19 has really shown a spotlight on the lack of testing capacity, actually across countries and across all levels of the health system. But it has catalyzed actions, you know, actually identified five years ago in the Jim O'Neill um, AMR review including and notably the setup of an international coalition for action. And so, you know, these new forms of collaboration and strengthened partnerships, I think, are something very worth looking at and, and learn from and to learn from and, and expand. As you said, I'm the co-convener together with Peter Sands from the Global Fund of the ACT Accelerator. Uh, and that ACT Accelerator sets out to ensure equitable access to COVID-19 tools, notably also diagnostics. And, um, and so, you know, I think what has been special about this um, global partnership approach is that it's enabled us to make rapid progress, um, but notably to speak with one voice. AMR is a silent pandemic. And so I think even more important, it requires also a loud voice. And so the, this urgency, the, the emergency really has enabled, um, um, you know, uh, multiple organizations to come together, but also political leaders to come together in the ACT Accelerator platform and, and make the needs being heard. Um, you know, it's, it's, for example, led to the fact on the diagnostic side that we have had the first rapid diagnostic tests available to countries, especially also to low and middle income countries within eight months, WHO policy approved, emergency use authorized, affordable, um, you know, at a price of three to five dollars. Um, and we've been able to address in the midst of the supply chain war the access issue, right? And by, by enabling equitable access, including for vulnerable populations and, and, and low and middle income countries more broadly. Um, so, you know, it's been a way to also deal with diagnostic nationalism, if you will. 
So that partnership, I think, is, is very worth looking at and preserving, especially also with regard to the political will, because that, when you look at access to MR diagnostics, is something that we need uh, much more. And, you know, if you see, look at, and, and Amadou has said it, right, if you look at how um, Africa has stepped up to this crisis, how the African Union has acted on COVID-19, it's really made a, a, ma a big difference in terms of access to diagnostics. My hope is, you know, that a lot of the investments in COVID-19 will enable us to make progress with AMR more rapidly going forward. For example, when it comes to um, the surveillance systems we built for COVID-19, those shouldn't be built in a siloed approach, right? But they should also be very much be used for, for better and more real-time AMR surveillance. When it comes to breaking silos, in most countries, the response to COVID-19 was enabled due to investments in tuberculosis, HIV, and malaria, right? And for the first time, we see, you know, we see that these um, disease programs basically have to step out of their box and have to um, enable multi-disease management. So, and, and for us, this syndromic, this management of patients with cough or fever is the way to go, right? Because patients don't present with TB or malaria. And so I think that breaking the silos is something that will benefit from, from, from AMR because that's also at the heart of the overprescription problem we see. We will have come out of this, I think, with a stronger workforce, and that's very important, both on the clinical and lab side. Um, and of course, you know, we'll have a rich pipeline in terms of innovation, and especially, and, and Amadou has said that, um, we'll come out of it with a dramatically changed diagnostic landscape, right? We'll, we see, India, Latin America, Africa step up in this crisis, addressing the supply chain war issue and, and basically, you know, you know, engage in local production efforts. We see innovative licensing models in this context, et cetera. And all that is highly relevant also for AMR diagnostics. And last not least, I think, um, also on the digital side, you know, we're for the first time introducing rapid diagnostic tests together with digital solutions that again enable better patient management, better patient acceptance, um, but also more real-time surveillance. And I think that's also going to serve us going forward. Um, and perhaps most starkly, I think COVID-19 provides the investment case directly for AMR, yeah. right? We've seen that, you know, governments already by September had spent 10 trillion U.S. dollars in terms of stimulus, 77 billion um, of public investment in 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 R&D. You know, versus the O'Neill request of 40 billion over 10 years to tackle antimicrobial. <laughs> So I think, um, you know, I think the investment case is clear and also the return of investment, uh, the, the must to invest now and not to wait until costs explode and until the situation in AMR escalates. Hmm. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you, Paul, for just reminding us about the O'Neill report, which seems like another lifetime. Yes. Uh, and I, I do remember when that came up, people did raise their eyebrows about some of the figures there, but I think it all looks slightly um, less exaggerated, if I can put it that way. Um, indeed, it's worth maybe having a, a look at that. I'm going to ask you a question that's actually come from um, one of the audience members, from Francesca Chiara from the Wellcome Trust, I believe. So testing coverage differs between countries, and by, by definition, I would also mean the availability of tests may differ between countries. What should WHO and other organizations do to build more capacity? And I, I ask you this question much. because <laughs> I, I'll ask you this question because I think this has been very much part of FINE's mission, but you are mm -hmm. also quite closely connected with WHO, know how this organization works. So I'd like to get your insights on, on that actually. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's not a, it's not something that WHO can stem on its own, right? 
um, you know, we we very much see and and also have seen this in COVID, in the COVID context again that the systematic lack of investment in testing really means that today we're in a situation where not even the most basic testing capacity is available. You know, for example, when looking at 14 countries in low and middle income countries, we see that only 1% of primary health care clinics even have a basic set of, you know, the most essential eight rapid diagnostic tests that are needed. And even in hospitals in low and middle income countries, only 14% um, of, of district hospitals have these eight basic tests, and that's glucose strips, et cetera, available, right? So that shows you how weak the infrastructure is and, and, and you know, how low the starting point. Um, you know, and also, of course, it has a lot to do with demand, right? So today, right. When, when most low- and middle-income countries don't even have budget lines for diagnostics, very often they don't have... Um, national diagnostic strategies. Concretely back to the point on what WHO could do, right? So for example, WHO has set up only three years ago uh, and much needed an essential diagnostic list, you know, approximately 20 years after the inception of the, of the essential medicines of list. Course, yeah. um, but that has not yet translated in into countries having essential diagnostic lists. So, so far, India globally is the only country that has an EDL, an essential diagnostic list. So I think WHO working with countries and partners for, for countries to have national diagnostic strategies, to have essential diagnostic lists for their country so would be a good starting point. And then you know, we've signed an MOU with WHO in January, actually, just before COVID-19 hit, to then work with them on an accountability framework so that we could track progress against these mm -hmm. essential diagnostic lists in countries. And I think, um, you know, measuring progress against these diagnostic roadmaps, I think that would be something very concrete that would enable us to also have better visibility and, and transparency going forward. Um, you know, I, I clearly think, though, that a primary issue with, we face is, is and, and, and Amadou has said that, um, you know, the lack of, of prioritization in national budgets, the fact that drugs are cheaper in most cases than a test, um, you know, and so that requires different interventions and, and WHO clearly cannot tackle that on its own. On the testing side, clearly, you know, we need more innovation for many of the problems. We don't have the right diagnostic tools. Robin spoke about um, blood culture, for example, earlier, and, and that's a good example where you know, in many settings, it's impossible today to introduce the blood culture systems we have available in terms of, you know, the need for maintenance, for trained staff, for power supply, for running water, right? So we need different tools. And that holds even more true for primary health care setting tools. Um, and we need them to be much less expensive and, and more affordable. Um, and then in terms of prioritization, of diagnostics and tests, I think that's where COVID-19, coming back to that topic, can really uh, make a difference because we see more willingness to invest. We see, as Amadou has said, that, that countries have realized that in many, in a, in a certain way, diagnostics and testing, it's the eyes and ears of healthcare. Mm -hmm. Yes, very and much so, and it's actually- Provide a clearer value proposition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. And as, as I think was also mentioned that, uh, you know, the buzzword is health system strengthening today. And I think uh, mm -hmm. if we make the link between a strong health system and diagnostic capacity, yeah. I think it's it gets us around this issue about, you know, drugs versus diagnostics, because I, I, I've seen that dilemma working yeah. out, uh, having worked in countries across the world, in, in especially in, in fragile health systems. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you very much, Katrina. We're now moving to the last part of our webinar where we will have an open Q&A session with all the um, participants. So um, if we could unmute uh, all the participants and have them back uh, uh, on video, um, that would be great. 
um, and I could start with just a, a set of questions. And if, if you haven't already submitted any questions, um, um, please feel free to do um, to do so. Uh, uh, and hopefully, we may be able to come around to um, uh, to one or through two two of them. So I have, a, I have a question that we can perhaps start with, and I'd like to put that over to um, uh, to Erin. And um, you know, we uh, coming from the drug side, we we often talk about um, you know big pharma exit, and maybe that's changing. Um, we hope, um, but certainly big pharma being very active in the field of drug development, uh, and of course, from our, from the perspective of drug development, it's very much. Um, an SME's game in, in terms of, of uh, what's happening on the innovation side. Do you see any parallels with diagnostics at all? Is this something that's similar? Uh, and what can we do to help the ecosystem uh, on the R&D side? That's a great question. I do think there are parallels and you know parallels, again, both in terms of the access to funding, uh, parallels in terms of the downstream, uh, you know, support in terms of market uptake and access, et cetera. Um, and in our own portfolio today, you know, what we do see are a number of very small companies um, with, you know, highly innovative, highly risky tech. Um, we, we certainly have seen and, um, you know, maybe more recently are seeing interest from the larger companies as well. And there may be, you know, again, different roles to play here. Um, again, you know, just in an analogy to COVID, you know, we do have these, you know, very small, super innovative groups. Some are very good at assay development and don't need to build the whole mousetrap. Um, and so are there ways to take those assays and put them on the big install bases you know, from the bigger product developers? And so we may be able to bring the bigger companies back, um, you know, marrying hot tech with, you know, their existing platforms and how to expand them. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, I'd just like to move over to you, Robin, in case you may have a comment about that. But I'd also like you to answer maybe another question that was posed by um, one of the audience member, uh, Maha Hassan. Um, do pharmacists, uh, so I'll, I'll ask the second question, but you can obviously answer on the first one that I posed. Mm -hmm. Do pharmacists have any role in diagnostics? And for instance, where you work in, in, and in your uh, center, how do you integrate pharmacists into that picture? Yeah, those are two great questions. Uh, for I'm going to go back to the first question that, that Aaron was answering. Uh, as a microbiologist, I really think we're in a several decade long microbial genomics revolution. And that is leading to the microbial diagnostics that we're seeing emerging. Uh, even, even COVID-19, I mean, had this happened in 1960, uh, for example, we wouldn't have diagnostics for it. HIV also, right, benefited from arriving at the right time so that we, the world, could deliver diagnostics to help combat that crisis. And I think we take for granted things like PCR and so forth and other nucleic acid amplification technologies, uh, but we're still really realizing the benefits of those and how they can be developed and deployed cheaply, um, accurately, and I'm going to answer now your second question, and in multiple different locales. I really think that as we go through the genomics revolution, I'm not going to talk about sequencing-based diagnostics, but I think that's also going to help here eventually, um, that diagnostics are not the realm necessarily of a sophisticated microbiology laboratory, such as the one that mm -hmm. I work in, where we have now over 500 staff working in clinical microbiology, a ridiculous number that has grown because of COVID-19. But we really need to get diagnostics to the people who need them. And uh, having centralized testing is not always the answer for everyone, especially as technologies advance. So who can run diagnostics? Well, in, in my view, if they're really developed well and deployed well and acted on properly, anyone, and that includes pharmacists, of course. And pharmacists are trained healthcare professionals, so, so why not? Uh, but I don't think it's desk pharmacists either. Great, thank you very much. 
Um, Amadou, I'd like to move over to you um, to ask you the next question. Um, so, you, and this is something that you've alluded to, the value of diagnostics has really been demonstrated uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, not just to policymakers and governments and funders, but I think actually to the general public, they start to understand what a critical role it plays in the whole evolution of the, uh, the, the pandemic. Um, so how do, you, how do we maintain and actually create further van, uh, awareness on um, the value of diagnostics, both at, at the general population level, but perhaps more also now, uh, you know, people who make the decisions and control the purse strings? Um, so, you know, I just want to kind of take a bit more of what you'd said earlier. How can we maintain that, that awareness and, and that momentum? I think it's uh, the way I think we should convince people that this is important. We are actually, I believe, halfway in the sense that people really realize some important aspects. Even though I'm still desperate to see more fun coming to diagnosis. So, I think uh, you are data showing how diagnostic impacting economically um, the health system and the economy in general. Um, and I think this has to be shown much, much better. Uh, the reason why I'm saying that is today I receive more call about people from the finance and business world about how do we get rid of COVID because the business and the economy is good, than really people that are worried about the health uh, uh, system. So I think that targeting right information and business is probably a, a very important aspect. I think the second, uh, the second way also we have to do, uh, we really have to work out, is not having the data. But my feeling is as a scientist mostly, we do not, we are not very good at educating people about what we're doing. We are very technical. So making sure we talk to community and being listening, because that's the community that really makes a difference. Today, COVID is a problem in many countries because the population are being vocal. And they're vocal because they feel like they have their problem are not taken care of. So educating them on the role of diagnosis would bring these people to be able to talk to decision makers at the highest level to bring them where we actually going to need to, to invest money and where we're going to improve the system. And lastly, I think it's, it's very important that from our side, we change the way we are, we are making the tools. Today, I'm very optimistic about what Robin was saying. Diagnostics should be like a, a regular product of consummation, even though it's highly important that if everybody can do a test and be educated to do it properly, then it's like people would use their cell phone, people would use something that they use on a regular basis. And if in terms of innovation, we can reach that level to make sure that we are doing reliable tests, can put it in the end of everybody without uh, uh, serious issues and helping the, the, the health of people, then this, this is going to change the way people look at diagnostics and going to support it in long term. Manika, are you still there? So let Sorry, me I'll you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll unmute. Yeah, I'm there. I'm still here. Sorry, I've got a question for you, Katrina, in fact, which is from an audience member. Um, and uh, it's uh, from um, a Betsy Wonderly trainer. So, uh, Katrina, do you think dedicated funding for AMR will be needed in order to build testing capacity and leverage the COVID-19 investments in local diagnostic manufacturing diagnostic platform scale-up, digital health solutions, and data reporting systems? Uh, it's quite a lot there, um, but I think the, the bottom, bottom line question is dedicated funding. And if you do, where do you see this coming? Uh, is it from similar streams in HIV, TB, and so on? So um, over to you, and good to, good to see what, what you think about this, Katrina. Why are you optimistic? Do you think this is possible um, uh, or not? Yeah, and maybe can I briefly comment on the previous questions also, right? So sure. clearly my answer to Betsy is dedicated funding will be needed 
um, you know, local production efforts, for example, will have been catalyzed. And, you know, actually one joint project is in Senegal with, with Amadou. And so there, from that experience, we know that it, it takes a while to build that production capacity. And then it takes some time to expand the menu. Um, and of course, at the moment, this local production capacity is still very much focused also on rapid diagnostic tests. Um, and we need that for for other um, you know other technologies as well. But I'll come. I can. I'm happy to come back to that. Um, you know. But maybe to to the other questions, I want to add. First of all, in in response also to what Aaron said, right? In our COVID nineteen pipeline, we see we have in the meantime over 900 companies registered that work on on diagnostic tests. And exactly as Aaron says, the vast majority of those is, is relatively small companies. So it's a fragmented landscape. Having said that, you know, we see that by year end, by end of 2020, the global testing capacity and the global production capacity for, for diagnostics will have tripled, right, from the beginning of the year. So that's a massive increase in, in capacity globally. Um, and that should, you know, that should have effects going forward. And it's really going to transform, I think, where we will di see, see diagnostics being supplied from going forward. Um, you know, there will be a lot of automated robotic manufacturing lines available, et cetera. So I think that, you know, will, will drive change for other diseases. Um, yeah. yeah. And... Um, yeah. Then I think the other the other thing I wanted to quickly comment on the pharmacies. So so you know I be, I believe that the role of pharmacies in low and middle income countries will be absolutely critical going forward. Right as as we all know you know for example the role of the private healthcare sector is increasing. A lot of prescription of antibiotics happens directly in pharmacies. And that's why we actually have a, a pretty well-trained workforce globally. Um, so when we speak to patients, there's huge demand for self-testing, for, for receiving diagnostics in, in pharmacies. And that's true across diseases, pretty much whatever disease we look at, there's, there's significant demand for, to enable patients to get testing exactly where they did seek treatment or to, to get tested at home or in their communities. So I think um, pharmacies will, will play a huge role. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I have another question, but I'd, I'd like to direct this to Erin first and then Robin. Um, and it's a fairly simple question. Um, uh, from uh, Emily uh, Monason. Um, so far, there's been a lot of discussion about rapid diagnostic tests uh, for bacteria. But what about fungi? Um, are there similar advances uh, in diagnostics? Um, do we have similar challenges? And I say this because, um, you know, I've been asked this question many, many times. Um, so, you know, do you think we should be doing more to fund the diagnostic pipeline for fungi? Um, I mean, that's a question that could go to Carbex, of course. Um, but um, is, this, is this also a significant clinical problem um, that we will face in the future? And having also worked in, in many different countries and settings, I can say personally that fungal infections are obviously notoriously difficult and often hide behind other pathologies or are mistaken for other pathologies. And we also have a problem with the use of antifungal drugs as well across the world. So I'll go to Erin first and, and then to Robin. I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Um, sure. So for a simple question, I'll give you a simple answer, which is that absolutely, um, you know, I, I think we all feel that the challenges are similar, the needs are there. Um, you know, certainly these days, everybody's talking in particular about Canada Oris. Um, and, you know, and so, yes, um, because the same challenges from research to who's doing the research and supporting it are there. Um, before I finish, I did want to come back to um, you know the, the initial question because it also I think relates to uh, fungal infections um, and and who's working on these. And in addition to um, you know what I said, there are two other elements that I think are important for all of 
um, you know, what we're talking about here, uh, AMR and also fungi now, which is that uh, with the exit of the larger companies or the lack of participation today, let's say, um, you lose that, uh, that knowledge base and that experience base. Um, so in addition to funding the activities of these smaller groups, it really is important to build a wraparound service for them. And we've been very lucky to do that uh, with our, our programs um, in diagnostics as well by having a robust advisory board, which of course includes Robin, who's on the phone here today, um, but also is uh, incredibly well supported by FIND uh, through our colleagues, uh, Pete Daly and Jen Osborne. So I wanna emphasize that. And then one other thing that is, I think, very important um, as well, and again, uh, across the spectrum here, is something that Robin had mentioned in her comments. So we have, you know, we have investment in the early stage work, um, but just like with AMR and uh, small molecule development, the advanced development work, and so in diagnostics, clinical utility studies, which Robin had mentioned, et cetera, who pays for those? Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's, these are very challenging things. And so I think we need to think about the whole spectrum, not just the early stage. Yeah, and I'll take it from there. I'm going to start by saying I don't think that's a simple question uh, because mm -hmm. when we talk about fungal infections, we're really talking about a large diversity of types of infections from, say, uh, dermatophytes. Uh, to invasive uh, uh, endemic mycoses, which can cause significant disease even in people who are otherwise healthy, to fungi that infect uh, people who have underlying diseases. And fungal diagnostics, I would say, are lagging behind viral and bacterial diagnostics. They are, in some cases, more rare conditions, I would say, but that doesn't mean they're not important conditions for the individual patients that have them. So personally, I see a bacterial, viral, a parasitic, and fungal diagnostics as all being important. And I, I hope that the diagnostic revolution that we're going through because of genomics, proteomics, and COVID-19, uh, since that's the topic here, which I think is absolutely true, will help us uh, with fungal diagnostics. We do have some rapid fungal diagnostics. Think about cryptococcal antigen testing, right? Yeah, sure. That I would say is a shining star example of a great diagnostic, right? It is state of the art, no matter where you are, it's <laughs> rapid and it's very important. Cryptococcal meningitis is a very severe fungal disease as we all know. And there are others as well. Um, Pneumocystis hirovecii shows up on some of the multiplex um, nucleic acid amplification panels now that are available. And, and so we're emerging. I would say we globally do a terrible job at diagnosing severe fungal infections. And yeah, so there's yeah. significant room for improvement there. But it, it does become a prioritization issue. I mean, how many different things are we asking for at one time? Ooh. I'm hoping that, as has been said with COVID-19, we'll learn and then we'll be able to address all these issues through technology advances and hopefully make them cost effective and available to those who need them as well. And just right. to very quickly, just to very quickly add to this, uh, Monica, you know, the WHO has listed actually a number of these rapid tests in the latest edition of the essential diagnostic list you know, mm. the cryptococcal antigen RDTs, the um, the aspergillosis, um, you know, RDTs mm. as well that are pretty good quality. And so just back to the access problem, right? Because actually in most places we look, we see that fungal, the fungal problem is much bigger than, than we think. For example, you know, we've just completed an assessment in India where we see that 11% of, um, of T tuberculosis treatment failures actually have aspergillosis and not uh, and and are not uh, not actually T cases in Latin America. Many more cryptococcal infections than we previously thought, etc. Um, but so we're back to the access barriers and to getting these tests into use that are actually good, very decent tests. I, I really like that point. I think no matter where you are in the world, we're missing diagnoses because we don't have good diagnostics 
and we're working on syndromic uh, clinician-based diagnoses as we would have maybe 50 years ago. And quite frankly, I'm a clinician, so I can say this, we're not always right based on our intuition. And we, we have now the possibility of having tools that will hopefully tell us the truth. Right. I'm going to take that next question for Amadou, and then actually maybe um, if the others uh, want to answer, you're, you're free to to chip in. Um, I mean, I think we and and we've all been very focused, obviously, on COVID nineteen over the next year or two, and I'd like to get a, a country perspective on this, uh, Amadou. Um, how are we going to repurpose back to other issues as we get on top of COVID nineteen? including uh, antimicrobial resistance. Um, I, do you think this is going to be a challenge? Uh, and, and do you see major, or do you rather see major opportunities as, as has been alluded by all of you? Um, so I'd just like to get a feeling from you, uh, sitting where you are, whether you've actually thought about this or perhaps not. I mean, perhaps that this is, is not the right time, but I think um, uh, it would be good for you to share your thoughts on that. Yes, thank you very much, Manika. I think uh, what definitely uh, COVID has brought us is a really lot of opportunities uh, and showcase from which we can build the future. One has been really touched by um, Katharina about digital uh, platform. I see the digital transforming most of the country from LMICs and particularly Africa. As a decentralization has been extremely um, Quick because you can digitalize. I mean, today through some electronic systems, you can improve uh, surveillance and you can improve uh, at the same time testing in, in general and the way that people can have their result quickly, which is going to improve the whole uh, system, whether you're talking about medical, analytical, or post analytical. So, digital, what has been done so far in terms of app, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, new way to, to do things uh, is something we can get on that may be very important for the future. Uh, the second line is really with COVID, there is a huge um, uh, appetite for local manufacturing and building strongly actively the supply chain. So local manufacturing is really when it comes to diagnosis where we see the futures in LMIC because it would help not only to uh, reduce costs, which is a major driver, as I said earlier, but also it would help the manufacturer to focus on local needs, which imply that the product is going to have much better uptake because the product is going to be really designed and thought because of the local context. And for that reason, you may have the tools, the tools that are completely actually align with the specific needs in terms of cost, in terms of delivery, and in the way that people are going to use it, how to educate people to do that. So, which I think is something that people have really realized uh, because of COVID, because when you have lockdown and, and and you have to think how you can make things happen, this is something critically important. And one last thing uh, I want to mention that we learned from COVID is really having the dialogue at the societal level. I think the country that has been very good in discussing what was the problem and how to address it at the societal level has been really good in, in doing COVID. Can I just take the example of my own country? I mean, we really, uh, I, I'm really surprised sometimes why people are fighting over whether we should have masks or not, whether we should have uh, lockdown or not. And I realize that has been extremely important in this COVID is how people as a society discuss how some important medical tools can be applied to the large population. And this is something we should build on to address AMR, to address the epidemics, to address surveillance, because that's a new way to talk to each other. And I think this is something uh, that's maybe a good legacy that we should take from, uh, and lesson that we should take from COVID. I'll listen to you. Great, thank you. Does anyone want to add to that um, before we start closing up the webinar? I, I would like to add to that. I think that communication about these diseases and diagnostics and what we should or shouldn't be doing uh, needs to be a discussion that's not just between medical experts. It does need to involve our, our patients and our governments and so forth. And I think that COVID-19 has really illustrated that. 
it's hard enough to communicate around COVID-19 and to understand it. It shouldn't be, but, but it is, as we know from these discussions. But communicating amount around AMR is just so challenging. Even I have a problem communicating to the general public and patients about what exactly it means. And so I think that's a challenge for all of us, you know, experts in the medical arena to, to figure out how to communicate around AMR uh, to the people that it's really affecting. Great. So um, we only have a few minutes left. So I would like to just go around each of you um, to share some final thoughts um, to the audience um, today. So just if you could give a 30 second, a maximum one minute summary. Um, I'll start with you, Erin, and we'll work around. So um, over to you, share some, some final thoughts, Erin. Yeah, thanks. And, and thanks again for including me in, in this uh, really interesting webinar. Uh, I, I think the, the bottom line, again, is that uh, we are in a pretty unique moment of time here uh, with COVID, where we have the opportunity to educate, as, as we've been talking about here, but also to act. Um, you know, again, there have been platforms built, there have been resources uh, marshaled and, and creativity unleashed. And I think if we can capitalize on that for AMR, you know, across the board, but certainly in diagnostics, uh, I think we will be well served to do so. Great. Robin? I completely agree. I, I think we're learning about what works and what we can do and how quickly we can do things with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. but, but thinking about not just learning, but taking what we've built and hopefully repurposing it after we've you know, gotten out of the immediate crisis of COVID-19, which we hope is sometime in the near future, but we don't know when that really will be. And taking what we've developed technologically and kind of repurposing it for our other crisis that is sort of continuing along uh, could be really, really helpful. Hmm. Amadou, some final um, Yes, uh, just wanted to say that AMR, and diagnostic in general uh, is about the health system. Uh, we have to be very clear on that. If we are doing diagnostic right, we have the whole health system going to be working. And AMR is a fantastic example where by improving the diagnostic, we, we're going to have a good opportunity to maintain the whole health system. And for me, that's very important. It impacts everything uh, from the economy, the humanitarian, the health communications, and we should focus on, on that perspective, not on the health system perspective, not specifically on AMR or diagnostic per se, but in the health system, other two. Right, Katrina. Yeah, so I think exactly as you say, Manika, the, the next year, I think we'll focus a lot on strengthening global pandemic preparedness, strengthening health security, um, and I think a lot of the funding streams will flow towards that. So for me, it's absolutely critically important that antimicrobial resistance is part of and, and, you know, an integral part also of the Build Back Better um, agenda that, that is getting drafted as we speak. Um, because if it's not, I think we, it's not going to happen automatically. As Amadou says, Health system strengthening is a key component, but it also takes a coordinated response. So building on the right the partnership structures that we may have created for COVID-19, it takes flexible and adaptable technologies, and, and we have critical innovation gaps um, in, in antimicrobial resistance, if you think, for example, about the differentiation bacterial versus viral, um, but also for a lot of the pathogens at hospital levels, we lack the right tools. And last but not least, integrated delivery into health systems. And that again mm -hmm. needs a dedicated effort that goes beyond the, the general and broader health system strengthening. Thank you. So I think each of us should play a role in helping us build that agenda and making AMR be part of it. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Thank you very much, Erin, Robin, Amadou, and Katrina. Um, we're now going to be closing up this webinar. I'd like to share some final thoughts. I think an excellent summary by our four uh, participants at the end there. Um, but I think what has clearly come out here as a theme with COVID-19 uh, is the issue around pandemic and pandemic preparedness and response. Uh, and clearly, I think we have uh, to really uh, reflect and think that for antimicrobial resistance, we have a, a, another parallel pandemic going on, causing more than 700,000 deaths a year already. It's a growing problem, um, but it's a very different one. It's a, it's a silent pandemic, as has been noted by some of our participants, uh, and um, pot potentially its effects are probably felt more slowly over a longer period of time. But we do now need to think about how we address antimicrobial resistance with um, pandemic uh, preparedness and response in mind. And particularly when it comes to diagnostics, therefore, diagnostics have such an important and critical role to play. Uh, I think has been mentioned, there are some, uh, by, by, by the participants, there are some gaps uh, on the innovation side. There's much more we can do on the implementation science. Um, we also need to be thinking about diagnostics as part of strengthening health systems, and this should go in a broader agenda of uh, development and the SDG 30. Uh, but most importantly, um, that this is such an integral part of how we deliver um, uh, quality healthcare uh, across the world. So I'd like to thank you all very much for joining us in this webinar. Um, we've had a fantastic uh, a bunch of speakers. I'd like to thank all the organizers working behind the scenes to put this together. Uh, and just to finish up, we'd like to put up a slide on the next webinar in the series, which I believe is the fourth uh, and last. I hope you can um, join us uh, for that webinar. Uh, and again, thank you very much for your time. Uh, have a good day, all of you. Thank you.